Um, hey, I'm actually really excited to be here. Uh, in case you have not had time yet to look at that, that is indeed right, right now. That is from the Oktoberfest, that is from one of the tents, that's the Hofbräu tent. Um, they will continue to do that for about, uh, no, not for about, for exactly one hour and, f uh, and 27 minutes, and then they stop. <laughs> um, tomorrow it would go longer, since then it's weekend. Um, so we might look into that once in a while. Uh, so what I'm going to present today is some of my results of my ethnographic study and it got accepted and, uh, and I defended it in 2013 in Tübingen or at the University of Tübingen in the Department of Social and Historical Anthropology. And last year my book got published. Um, it is, the English title would be Solid and Liquid and the German is Fest und Flüssig. Now I have to say, while well, in German you have all those nice alliterations, so Fest und Flüssig, das Feiern im Festzelt, als cultural performance, in the English you lose this completely. Um, I also have to make one statement about Fest. Fest, for those of you who are familiar with German, is actually has two meanings. It is either a noun, then it is das Fest, which is a festival, a fest, or it is an adjective, then it's fest and it means solid, hard, stable. Which allowed me to play a little even with words and meanings. So the first one is um, that you have a, when you watch what happens over those hours, those many hours that people are celebrating, it actually gets from a rather fest, so a solid state, to this you can say kind of liquidly nice hopping around. So you might say that the f even the physical condition of how people behave is changing. The other one where it works very nicely is um, there is order and there is disorder. So, <laughs> hey, talking about disorder, do not expect any orgy. So some friends might have told you that, but then it often happens outside the tents. Or if you are too disorderly, you actually just get ushered out. So this is rather a banal little entertainment, a playground for adults. Um, and the other one where also this um, pair of words of solid and liquid works is um, there are traditions. You can go back decades, centuries, and you can say, oh, this hasn't changed. But then, yes, there is change. So this is not, it didn't get stuck in time, and it's just being repeated and repeated. So there is a lot of things, they are new or they're changing all the time. So you might not believe it, but that people are wearing those dindles and lederhosen, that is rather new. So uh, 20 years ago, it started in Munich, and where I did my research in Stuttgart, no, nobody, only senior citizens or people that had something to do, like waitresses or musicians, you would have caught them in this supposedly traditional garb. Everybody else <coughs> went there like this. So there is something that seems to be old, isn't old at all. Um, okay. I have no problem if you're asked in between questions because the problem is some things I consider as set as knowledge and they might be for you new or different. So just ask and if I think I'll ask those, I'll answer those questions later, I'll tell you so. Um, another one. We call that kind of location um, either Festzelt, so festival tent, or beer tent, Bierzelt. Um, even if they don't look like, they are indeed big tents. 
You have canvas over an aluminum frame. They're being set up for two months. Then people celebrate for about 16 days and they're being then completely dismantled and taken off and disappear. Um, the question, that's also important to know, the question that drove my research was not why people go there. I just assumed, hey, you go there because you like it, otherwise you wouldn't. Um, I was rather wondering what happens in these tents. So I will not say halls, beer hall, it, this makes me, I don't know, for a hall I always think this is stable and it's a structure and that stays, but it is that ambulatory, it, it, you know, it comes and goes. So I'll keep on saying tents. Um, anyway, what happens in these tents that normal, rational people um, they behave normal in ordinary life, you know, in the everyday life. You go there and after having spent some time there, you forget your manners and you behave to some degree deviant. So examples would be people stand on their seats, on their benches. So yes, you see here some still sitting, but eventually all people will stand. That is normal, or maybe even on the table. Um, people eat with unwashed fingers. Um, you can be loud and boisterous. Um, there's unrestrained chanting, yelling. There's happy screaming of indecent language by thousands of people. So if you are familiar with German, and I <laughs> excuse my language, but see this as part of research. So um, there is a song. Um, where the term scheiß egal is being mentioned, which means shit whatever. Then uh, there's another song where it is luda, that's bitch. Then you have sauf du sack, that is swig your dick. <laughs> and people just do that. Um, or they do ridiculous, da ridiculous dance moves or little pranks, such as this. Let's hope. <laughs> So that was all, you know, that somebody just slid down a table. It's a little transgression, but not something you normally do at the corner bar at a weekend. Um, the methods to answer my research question was I did field work um, and did uh, participant observation. Um, and I did this uh, from the visitor's point of view. So I didn't want to know how is it if you work there, I wanted to know how is it if you celebrate there. And uh, over two years, that was a, comp a total of two seasons, I did 26 visits. And I have to say, every time after I was done, I was actually sick. So this is the takes a lot. Um, then I did quality qualitative interviews with experts, so organizers, um, hosts, so the people that run those tents, uh, a musician, waiter, brewery officials. Then I did a quantitative survey in buses that are heading to um, the fair. And I did a video analysis by watching and examining I mean, hours of YouTube videos. It's full. So people visiting there always think I need to put it online. So and last but not least, I relied on webcams. So this one you saw earlier in Munich is not the only one. There are others too. And I watched that for hours. And the one I watched had actually no audio. And then I have to really say as much as I liked the participant observation, it was really boring. <laughs> OK, and today <laughs> I want to present some of my findings. Um, while, as we saw earlier, actually people are celebrating in Munich at the Oktoberfest or in Stuttgart 
at the Kunsthalle Volksfest. Now, Oct I used in, 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 in the title of the talk Oktoberfest style because I knew, okay, that's what you know. However, the larger term we're using in German is Volksfest. And the Oktoberfest is just one of them. And yes, it is the largest of its kind worldwide. It has about six million visitors. And it's um, the international and the national gold standard when um, Germans refer um, or you refer to those festivals involving beer, beer halls, music, amusement park. And just to make that, drive that point home, lesser known is that there are a total of similar, for example, 29 festivals or fairs with more than 1 million visitors each in Germany and more than 1,000 smaller ones. So this is not something very special. And they are called Volksfest. And the example, this is where I did most of my um, field work is in uh, Stuttgart. If you don't know where Stuttgart is, so there is Munich that is in the southeast. Stuttgart is in the southwest. And uh, Stuttgart has about a half a million inhabitants, but it's quite densely populated around it. And the other significant thing about Stuttgart is that is where Mercedes are produced. This is where Porsche comes from. IBM has its headquarter there. Uh, the American NATO headquarter is there. So, but still, most people don't know Stuttgart. <laughs> um, and in Stuttgart, you have about 4 million visitors. Um, together, based on a, on a study of the German Association of Fairground Entrepreneurs, um, to all these German fairs, they count about one, that was in the year 2000, they count about 100 million visits. That number exceeds um, all visits to Bundesliga soccer matches, all visits to theaters, operas, musicals. So this is something that is rather, yeah, it's pop culture. It is what people do. Um, this term Volksfest uh, refers to a type of fair that dates back to the 19th century. Volk means people in German. So it is the people's fest. Um, and it started back then as an amusement teaching and patriotic opportunity given by the authorities to everyone. So the folk, without restrictions along religious lines, estate or guilt considerations. So just to explain that, before that, like in Baroque times, it was not if there was a fest that everybody celebrated. It might have been uh, the Guild of Shoemakers or the Guild of the Cabinet Makers that celebrated. Or if you happen to be of the wrong religion, you didn't get to celebrate at all. Whereas those Volksfests were completely open in the sense of everybody could come. And this idea of everybody open, uh, everybody can come open is you can point this out is so the access to the fairground was and is free you just walk on um, and it is in a sense you could argue a democratic mass event in monarchic times because that's when it was started so the first one is the Oktoberfest that was 1810 it was initiated by crown prince Ludwig I because he had a wedding in October. And yes, then they celebrated in it, it in October, but eventually you, they moved it forward because in September the weather is so much nicer than in October. Um, and the purpose of this fest in Munich, Bavaria, was besides that you celebrate a wedding, was also um, Bavaria, Bavaria was at that point a new kingdom. So Napoleon, made out of the old dukedom, the electorate, a kingdom, and they increased in size. So th the goal was, you know, to get positive feelings of your subjects, oh, let's have a celebration and invite them to a fest. In Stuttgart, 
um, the Volksfest was first celebrated in 1818. And in this case, also a newly crowned king, also thanks to Napoleon. And um, th so part of his thing was also, you know, to do something for his subjects. However, in uh, 19, no, in 1815 or 16, in Indonesia, a, an, a volcano exploded. And then they had a severe, um, they were actually starving. And then the idea was, can we teach our farmers how to use latest technology? And how do we teach them? Oh, we just make a big fest. And everybody comes, and they do a parade. And then we have the fair and a convention. And then they learn the latest agricultural technology. In Stuttgart, for the first festival, you had 30,000 visitors in one day. Meanwhile, in Stuttgart, the fest lasts 17 days. And in 2018, they will celebrate their 200th anniversary. And just to explain this, or to if you see that, that's actually kind of the same um, perspective. So this would be King William or Wilhelm II. And you can see the bridge. This is exactly that bridge. And there is, in this corner, for example, there is a Ferris wheel. We still have a Ferris wheel. And these are the precursors to the tents. Um, so I mentioned unrestricted free and open access. Is anyone here who has ever been at the Oktoberfest or in Stuttgart? Is your memory free and unrestricted access? Yes? OK, the fairground, but the tents? <laughs> exactly. So it is unrestricted, restricted, as so often. Um, so in general, the fairground is really open. You can just walk in. Um, this is like the main entrance to the Oktoberfest. However, bags are being controlled meanwhile. And first is um, they do not want that you bring alcohol on the fairground. Second, well, you might bring explosives. Unfortunately, this needs to be checked. Having said that, uh, in Munich on September 26, 1980, actually a right-wing extremist um, exploded a bomb. And uh, that bomb killed 12 people and injured um, 211. And where the yellow, do I get a mouse? So here, this is the memory side. And those who are controlling those is th these two with their um, yellow jackets. But obviously, you can see if there are two and you have so many people entering, wow, well, this is not 100% control. Now, in Stuttgart, um, two years ago, happened a truly amazing thing, never happened before. Uh, that was on the day of the German unity. This is the national holiday. That was a Friday. Oh. So it was a Friday. Uh, perfect weather. Uh, and they had to close the fairground because of overcrowding. They just closed it. And then people had to wait until, well, enough people had left. Um, but this was really the very first time. Um, now, different than the fairground is actually the beer tents. And in that case, you can say at this point, it is a reserved amusement. Um, so yes, you can get in the beer tents if you go there early in the mornings, or if they're, so if they're not too full. And if you're lucky enough to get one of the seats that are not reserved, so there are areas that are kind of reservation free. However, if you want to make sure that you get in there, you have to have a reservation. How does that work? Is um, you book uh, seats at a table in advance that goes in increments depending on the tens of five, six, eight, ten. So some tens say, hey, you've got to at least book ten seats. And um, 
the booking is, yeah, you pay a small fee, but basically it's minimum consumption. So in this case, this is of a Stuttgart tent. Um, you can see that if you go during the week and you want to sit in the center nave, this is here, red means it's sold out. Um, you have to purchase three beer, half a chicken, half a roast chicken. Uh, that's together 37 euros. Then you have to pay service and that makes it 40 euros 20. Um, so this is about 45 US dollars currently. This is actually not expensive. So on the one side. However, it isn't cheap either. Since what you have to keep in mind, if you would go, no, first, the average yearly household net adjusted disposable income in Germany per capita is $31,925. I, this, those, these are OECD figures. The US comparative number is 41,000. So the, the income level is lower. It's actually, uh, depending on how you calculate it, at least a third or 25% lower. The other thing is if you would purchase 10 liters of beer, of premium beer, that's 20 half liter bottles, at the supermarket you get them for 40 Euro, 14 euros. So here you pay um, for one beer, for one liter of beer, uh, what is this, 10 euros and let's say 10 euros and 80 or 10 or nearly 11 euros. Well, for that money you can get 10 liters if you purchase it at the supermarket. So this is not cheap. Those coupons you get, you can use them for beer, for soda, for food, for whatsoever. And you can drink alcohol-free beer or this is really up to you. Um, you can look into this reservation. So they are all sold out because this already happened. Um, the more exclusive, the better the place, or th that doesn't mean necessarily if you want to go there and party. That just means you have cushier seats and it's more cozy and it's more private, the more expensive it is. But what you can see, that if you would try to get there on Friday, mm -hmm. so tomorrow, after five o'clock, don't even try. It's, it's over. On Saturday, this is at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yes, you could still go there, but not where it is cheap. You can go there where you pay 50 euros or 75 euros or 65 euros. And then you're not necessarily where the party is. And Saturday evening, sold out. Sunday, hmm. however, Monday, there. On Monday night, there are still some tables. <sighs> Wait. Well, this is good enough. You could go there on Monday night. So here, a few tables are still open. Um, so where are those areas? I said earlier, those free areas where they are not reserved are actually right in front of the bandstand. Or somewhere further to the side. Um, so this is the inside. This is called a central nave. Yeah, like in the church or middle ship. And it's surrounded by boxes and you have a second uh, level. Uh, all tents have a bandstand and it's either in the middle of the tent or at one of the ends. Um, you have on the one side, there's the whole kitchen and, and, and the beer, so everything, what they do there, it's here. Then um, you have those boxes I mentioned. And those more exclusive areas, you have 
oh, I said this already, but you have seat cushions, you have tablecloths, you have more decorations, but you also are kind of at a sudden sitting here. So you might not even hear the band or just as, you, you don't hear it as much. So the way people celebrate in here is very different and often you have whole companies reserving that and inviting their customers. Um, now there is that those tents look that way is not um, accidental. Um, there is a goal behind it in interior design criteria. And it's really, and their, their uppermost purpose is, or the goal is, to make people feel comfortable. Because if people are comfortable and feel at ease, so we say gemütlich, that would be homely, you let your guard down and you actually you drink more beer. This is, <laughs> and, but the question is, how can you create a warm, homely atmosphere in a hall that is about the size of a football field or a soccer field. And what you do is first you make it down to earth. So you have draperies. They bring it down. Um, in Munich they often have only little um, fir trees decoration. Partly also in, in, in the afternoon, um, in the evening obviously it's dark eventually then you don't notice it. But in Stuttgart they all have those draperies. Um, you have lamps that they have in Munich. You can see this here. Those are the lamps. So they come down, so they, al they also make it smaller. Um, you have a wooden floor, you have separations, <laughs> or you get this kind of homely, this homestead feeling that there, are, there is used dialect, uh, dialect is used. Um, then, second, it is yesterday's rural atmosphere. So you have, you know, hops, weed, sunflowers, again, wood. You have this old farm look. You might have even somewhere some old utensils where they, it's like a pr pretend um, 200 years back. Um, then also the uniforms of the, the waiters. It's all this alpine style clothing or you have lettuce work. Then third, it's recognizable. So this is a specific look that doesn't change every year. They have it for years. And that look um, is supposed to communicate harmony, warmth, but also it is orderly. It's homely, it's clean. And that all symbolizes kind of safe. Feel safe, you know, let yourself, let it, let your guard down, be relaxed. Those criteria are also on the outside. Um, it's rule. The basic template is um, a South Bavarian farmstead, even if it does, isn't in South Bavaria. It, it just doesn't care. So this is in Stuttgart. And they used, actually, and they're very proud of this, they used even wood from Tyrolean um, alpine or mountainous um, chalets. Um, and you have those deep overhang here. So that also kind of promises protection. And at the same time, you invite with the illumination, you have windows, you have wide open doors often a beer garden or some kind of beer garden in the front where you can walk through and all so it is in, it invites you and at um, and at the same time it also marks what is in and what is out now i showed you earlier um, this one so here you can see nicely this is all the canvas this is how they look from top. It's very different. And we just looked at that. What you do not see on the other side, about half a mile away, is actually Mercedes-Benz. That's where they make cars. So this is not some bucolic setting. No, this is in the center of town. In Munich, it is exactly the same. It is in the center of town. And the odd thing is, so here you are, as urban as it gets, 
and then you pretend we are somewhere in the alpine rural area. But this is, you could even argue, hey, this offers you a vacation in the city and allows you to get away from this everyday life. Um, which would bring us to the separation. So the tent itself materializes the separation phase of Victor Turner's theory of cultural performance. This theory I used. Um, so according to the theory of Victor Turner, cultural and social facts are being displayed, questioned, and permanently altered or reaffirmed in a cultural performance. Typical examples could be a wedding. Yes? Cultural performance? Yes. Cultural performance. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. So a typical example is a wedding is a cultural performance. A bar mitzvah is a cultural performance. Carnival is a cultural performance. Or you could even argue a movie theater visit is a cultural performance. So the <laughs> idea of Turner is also that each type of society has his, her own self way of, of, of central cultural performance. And a cultural performance possesses three stages. Um, you have a separation phase uh, in which a participant steps out of their normal life. Then you have a liminality, which in that you basically, you're, you're separated from everyday life and now anti-structure sets in. So, um, you play with existing structural um, things, you, you create a new order, doesn't mean there is no order. Um, his idea was, this is like as if you're on a threshold in, 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 in two meanings. So it could be the threshold from to thresh. So you get kernels being exposed that tell us something about societies or in the sense of you're between two rooms. So often also, this is a, a rite of passage, has the same three faces. And in the middle, you're neither nor. But cultural performance is wider. This is not, so cultural uh, a rite of passage, well, you need a role or a status transformation. You don't have this here necessarily. Um, example, in the case of the fest ce celebrations, the visitors go to the fairgrounds and enter the tents. And as we all know, a fairground is a completely different world. So you have different sounds, different lights, it smells different, you know, you, you smell um, cotton candy, you have um, um, roasted almonds, you can, this is not your normal shopping downtown, it's just different. Um, even dressing in dundels or lederhosen, for example, reflects this. Um, another behavior that marks the transition is the first order of beer and the subsequent clinking and drinking. Um, now talking about clinking and drinking, uh, Germans are kind of particular with that. Uh, so you normally people go to the Oktoberfest or the Volksfest in a group. You don't go there alone. So the group arrives and the group orders. And now the group waits until everyone has their first beverage. Then when all everybody has a beverage, somebody starts to move the mug to the middle. And the other group members at the table or the bench um, they follow. This is a collective action. And then you clink. And while you do that, actually, you look at the others. So you make eye contact. And you try to clink with everyone. So you acknowledge the, pr the presence. And only after everyone has clinked, together, you take a sip. And if you decode that, uh, it means that you have a quasi-contract has just been made that it is actually okay in this round to get tipsy. And this is done collectively. And the group also confirms and strengthens its bond. So this is a rather inward um, action. 
This bond will loosen over the evening during the next hours. Um, and you could even say this kind of reflects a kickoff into this liminal phase. So in case you ordered a beer and you drink alone, then it could be that you actually get reprimanded by somebody on your table like, hey, if you drink alone, you booze. Or in German, wer allein trinkt, säuft. The German term saufen, and I'm not happy with any of the translations. Um, so trinken is the normal one for drinking, for drink. And that implies a measured consumption, whereas saufen, not. So this is if we say animals, in German we don't say that animals drink, actually animals do saufen. So there's this uncivilized, whereas if you, so that, and if you are called or if somebody says you, you, you do seufst, this is negatively connotated. You don't want that. Now in this second phase of the cultural performance of the liminality, um, participants experience, for example, flow, a so-called performative reflexivity, communitas and anti-structure. So the communitas, this idea is eventually you feel like you're with everybody else and since everybody is kind of, so the doings are synchronized. I need to get back. No, oh, I can use this. So this is way at the beginning and you can see they sit there are still spaces open and they stand already and celebrate. Eventually at night they all stand and all dance. And this is actually what it, you can say is part of this liminal phase that the behavior which is initially so different gets synchronized and people are falling kind of in lockstep. Um, and then, since now everybody is doing the same, and you might have three, four, five, six thousand people chanting along, you feel communitas. You feel the big we. Um, and th in the beer tents, this is called, so the musicians call this the so called party face. Um, so you arrive at the fairground, you get comfortable at your table, you warm up with clink and drinks in the group, you eat together, um, you eat together, um, and you do some dancing and singing. This all is between five and about eight o'clock, um, and eventually this middle ship is in sync. Um, I want to show that. This is kind of, I call this solid because this is what you really can expect when you go there. This is the typical German um, beer table and beer bench. That's even how we call them. And you find them either in this orange, you might have them in yellow, or maybe in a, in a, in a light brown, but that's about the colors and they're everywhere. Um, then also kind of as a tradition is uh, that half roasted chicken are being consumed. In Stuttgart, um, about half a million of them are being eaten each festival season. Um, they are normally brought without cutlery. So you have a little, um, you know, something to wash your hands, a little um, wet wipe, but that's about it. Um, Yes, there, is, there are knives. That's the haxe. So those are the, the pork, uh, pork feet. Yes, there you get a knife. Different than in Munich, in Stuttgart they give you a roll. In Munich you, you got just meat. <laughs> um, so, when the communitas has emerged, it is actually celebrated in the sense that you have this continuous singing in unison, your people clap rhythmically, you stamp with your feet or you move your bodies. There are line dances people make and now you have this sweet disorder. So it could be, I showed you initially that the, the person sliding down the table, but it could be also just those people stand too close. 
So you have no personal space. In that sense, the length of the table is 2 meters and 22 centimeters, which is a little more than seven feet, and it seats five. So that makes you, that gives you about <laughs> that much space, which means you are next to someone. And in Munich, um, they even put those benches next to each other. So if you sit, your back will touch somebody else's back. In Stuttgart, they actually leave space. That's really nice. But in Munich, people will invade in your personal space, which is, if you, this is kind of a violation of a normal rule. Um, then everybody stands on those benches. Um, and this posit der Gemütlichkeit is being sung. So this is in a Fraktur, how it is written. Uh, you might have heard about this. And what is initially just a little group event is in that case, if it goes well, now an event of thousands of people drinking in unison. And um, this is kind of the most famous German drinking ditty. It was written and is played since um, 1898. And it's a little short song and it had its start in Munich in the very first beer tent of modern proportions. And it has several thousand seats, and it had planned and organized music animation. Why? To get people drinking. So this is also a song that animates people to drink. And I want to read something to you by the American author of Thomas Wolfe. And he loved Munich and visited multiple times the Oktoberfest, and he wrote a little essay. Uh, which is published in his book, The Web and the Rock. And he, this is uh, dating back from um, 28, 29, so 1928, 29. That's about when he made those experiences. And he describes it. In an instant, they were all linked together, swinging, swaying, singing in rhythm to the roar of those tremendous voices. Swinging and swaying, singing all together as the band played Ein Prosit. Ended at length the music, by now all barriers broken through, all flushed and happy, smiling at one another, they added their own cheers to the crowd's great roar of approval when the song was ended. And the song is still being played. Um, it became quickly a beer tent standard because it had positive aspects for the host and for the audience. Um, let's first talk about the host. Well, if 3,000 people take three, four, five sips of beer, you just basically sold, I mean, huge quantity of beer. And if you get them to do this often, this is a way how you get people to consume beverages. In Munich, I read that it is between 60 and 80 times a day that this song is being played. I can show, I'll show you later in a, in a little while, in Stuttgart, uh, in the evening that one band had planned it 22 times an evening. Um, but it's also used to create the tent community. So people sing together, chant together, drink together, and people want to participate into that. Then it also increases this easy go atmosphere since translated ein Prosit der Gemütlichkeit could be equal to singing a toast to harmony. So frequent, and, and you, it's kind of as if you enchant with this and magically make it appear this harmony, you conjure it up. Um, I'll show you quickly um, a video and I have to say a little bit about that. It is, first of all, a private video. So uh, at one point, sound is missing. Um, then this is still in the warm-up phase. And now in this warm-up phase, you could say, ah, maybe this is still in the separation. It's maybe not yet in this party phase. Mm -hmm. Because you will see some people are sitting, others are standing. So there is a mixed behavior. Um, then it starts with a line dance. 
By the way, the line dances have the same function as drinking in unison or singing in unison. Now you move in unison. It's all about this big collective communities being created. Um, then you see, yeah, we'll hear people singing. You see people smoking. So while smoking is not allowed anymore in German bars or in, in Baden-Württemberg, this is from Stuttgart, in, in Baden-Württemberg, in bars or in restaurants, in the tents it is. Um, you hear yelling. Um, you see people sitting, others are standing on the benches or on the, uh, on the table. And then you have eventually this complex prosit. They sing it, and other than in Munich. In Munich it's just, they played a little song, and then it comes the Xufa, which is like past tense of saufen, which means drinking. Um, and then people drink. Whereas in Stuttgart, it's the big back and forth and it keeps on going so that people have time to celebrate and again, getting synchronized. And only at the very end, you're supposed to drink. This takes a while. In that case, is, that song is, well, more than a hundred years old. Fluid, uh, Mr. Dittrich did not, you know, intended all that back and forth or that they would say prego and grazie and what else is all in there. Mm -mm, this is all new. And you could argue it gets more differentiated out and you can show this. So. 50 years ago, you could only get beer in mugs. Well, now you can get alcohol-free beer. You get Weizen beer in, in those mugs. You get soda in the mugs. So you get even champagne. Yeah, you, so this has also, you know, differentiated out. It is, well, it's kind of, you can say, it's more pluralistic. Um, so this is what I want to show you also. This is how this prosit is planned. This is um, the playlist I got from a musician. This is what music they played on um, Wednesday, October 6th, on 2010. And every time read, you can see this is the prosit. This is um, when they play, they have breaks between. So this is round one, two, three, 
before. This would be still kind of warming up. This is when they try to sell food because when people only party, they don't eat anymore. So the goal is to sell food here. And that's also then the bands are actually encouraged not to go full-fledged into party mode. So they kind of still play a little slower songs, not too much party. In Munich, you will still hear traditional folk songs, not in Stuttgart, but it's still not the full party mode. And um, what you can also see is, so in round one, you have six times the prosit. And the prosit actually gets it's played more often before the music has a break. And why? Because then hopefully your mug is empty and the servers have easy access to you. And you're not partying because when you party and sing, you have no time to order beer. And you can see this too. It's like prose it, three songs, prose it, two songs, prose it. It's different than, for example, round three, it's 90 minutes, only six time, and in round four, it's only four times. If you look at that, it's actually after the last one, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven titles. No prosit at all anymore because now it's time to go home. You don't need to build a group anymore. Um, I did this, I showed, this is all German songs. However, there is tons of English songs. So if you see here, Sweet Home Alabama, this is a beer tent standard. <laughs> this is a stand, you know, another standard is here, Country Roads. So when I went there the first time, which was in the early 1980s, yes, it was played and it is still being played. These are standards. Um, or Relight My Fire, It's Raining Men. <sighs> yes. So this is not just that you have German songs. No, you have um, English songs. In earlier times, you had also Italian songs like Volare. So this is not just, you know, kind of a folkloristic show. Um, in Stuttgart, I uh, repeat myself, there is no Umbaba music anymore. So in Stuttgart, the bands they play have all this modern um, alignment. So you have guitar, band, you know, this is like a rock concert, kind of. But it isn't because you have cover bands playing. Um, what they do is you play, um, so how is the music presented? Uh, it is high in intensity in the sense of medleys are being played. So you have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight songs nonstop. Just one into the other. Um, and this is loud. It is really loud. So this is another form of intensity and it pushes forward. You know, music can be played rather laying back, but it can also push forward. This pushes forward. Um, then at the same time, it is the entertainment music pace. So it is between 120 and 140 beats per minute. This means it's not too slow and it's not too fast. And the fastness is if you clap, there is just so much pace you can, if you cannot clap like that over a long time. So you, so this is like the 140 or maybe 138 right now. Um, then it is simple songs. So. Simple harmony, simple melody, uh, monosyllabic choruses. So, <laughs> oh, ah, e, where you, even if you don't know the song, it's pretty easy to sing along because that's the goal. Um, so, and it's known songs. There is no song that people do not know. And how is it? Um, reach. The first is it's German oldies. So th they might have already a status as party song. Um, this is 99 Red Balloons. Those three, of three others here, this is all beginning 80s. There were hits in Germany and you might have heard of Kids in America. Might have heard. Also from the 80s. So it's not that people going there and it is not teenagers going there and it is 
yes, maybe some young adults, but the main um, audience are people between 25 and 40. So this is not the college crowd. Mm -mm. Um, and so this is the one you have German oldies, you have international or English oldies, um, and you have new party songs in German or in English. And those are either summer hits or they went through a party cycle. And the party cycle in Germany is the song gained popularity at carnival, at skiing, uh, on Mallorca, and then in the beer tents. So in that case, uh, which one is the one? Mm, I don't find it. There is one about um, summer. Wait. This was a Mallorca song. Or there is also one, I was looking whether I find it live being played in, in the tent because it tells a lot about, so Mallorca is an island in the Mediterranean. And Mallorca is the place where a lot of Germans go for three, four hundred bucks and spend a weekend there and drink and party. And they, um, the British do that too. And they have clubs and there is a certain music. And um, the music might be, does anyone know here, uh, from Rod Stewart, I am sailing. Okay, some know. So this is a song that was um, popular in the late 1970s. And uh, what um, one of those Mallorca artists did is they just changed instead of I am sailing, now the people are singing, translated, I am solo, so I'm a single. Um, and then they sing this, what, uh, whatever, uh, shit whatever. And then they keep on repeating this and eventually they sing, he is single. And then she is single and then we are single. So this is, the, te the level of text is somewhere here. It's really not hard, but if, would it be too complex? People cannot sing anymore. These are about 50 songs. How else are you supposed to sing that if it's too complicated? Um, you might not think this is remarkable, but it is, actually is that the majority of those songs are, or at least half, are in German. If you listen to radio programs targeted at people between 25 and 40, at least 75%, 80%, 85% are songs being played in English. So on German radio stations, you barely hear German songs. But then you go there, and at a sudden, it's one German song after the other. And um, I think parts of it is, well, it's the lyrics. You can just sing along. And you understand what you sing. Because Sweet Home Alabama, mm -mm -mm. yes, you might get the Sweet Home Alabama. But then uh, the most Germans are lost after that. The goal, I keep on repeating, we're coming to participation. P this is really about that people participate. And um, what increases this participation too is there is a back and forth. So often um, in this song, you have chants going back and forth. And if the tent is not answering, actually there is something missing in the song. And, and the songs are kind of done in that way that you do that. Have you ever heard of who the hmm is Alice? Uh, yes, and then it's being sung. This is also a, a smoky song. Just, yeah, okay. But this, this back and forth, those chants, this is important that this is happening. The program is rigid. So people, the, the visitors can ask for songs. Well, you can. But it might not be done, might. I mean, if there's too much singing and chanting for the same song, bands answer and play it. But this is kind of the program, and they do it. And even more so, here it's over. So even if you have 3,000 people chanting, encore, 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 it's over. And part of it is, 
there is rather, this is also solid if you want to say like this, you have rigid regulations when the last beer is being sold and when people have to leave the tents. And this is, um, we're not there yet. This is amazing when you, you can observe that. When they're done, it takes them about 15 minutes and then basically the tent is empty. Yes, there is security. They come with whistles and they shush you out. But there is no, no problem keeping in mind they are all having drunken some beer. But you get the people out talking about drinking some beer. Now, the goal of the evening is not to get completely inebriated. No. Because if you're completely um, drunken, you are not social anymore. So drinking alcohol and getting tipsy is a highly social process. They did measurements. People drink X in, or men tend to drink in unison. So they have about the same pace of how they empty their glasses. Women not, they might drink a touch slower. But this is highly social. If you are completely drunken, you are not social anymore. So you kind of undermine the whole process. Also, if you are too drunken and you might fall off the bench, before you know it, you are out of the tent. So this is, um, this is kind of a, so yes, a lot of people drink too much because you are also at the same time animated to drink. So then you might end up to drink one too many. But it is not the goal, this is not binge drinking. Because you cannot do, this after four hours, if you are completely liquored up, you cannot anymore. This only works if you're just tipsy, or maybe a little more, but that's about it. Also, um, keep in mind, we have, let's say, 30-year-olds. Oh, and when you're 30, you don't feel the urge to binge drink anymore. You just, no. And you go there often with your employer. That's another one. So you have your boss at the table, which means there might be some kind of um, social restraint to let everything go. Um, we're still kind of in this. Now, we have this sweet disorder or those actions. So this would be also one. And now just quickly, this is something I, I've stumbled upon in my research and I really don't know the answer. It's just something noteworthy. Um, and I don't know the answer because I never did interviews with people being in the tents because you cannot do interviews at that time. But, so I, when I handed out the questionnaire, I gave answers. And I gave the answer, I can if I want to paint the town red. That's a very inadequate translation of Ich kann, wenn ich will, die Sau rauslassen. And yes, you heard correctly, Sau, so female pig. Um, when you really kind of party completely, paint the town red. In German, we refer to it, you let your inner pig loose. <laughs> and it doesn't sound as people would, you know, give a high rating to it. And I wanted that. I admit this. So I added if I want to. And I thought, you know, this gives you enough leverage and, 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 and space to say, ah, I just didn't feel like, but yeah, I completely agree. This is not how people read my statement. They actually read it, I can paint the town red. And so I got, oddly enough, so totally agree, I had 20.8%, agree mostly, 157 sometimes about 30 percent. Okay, now was I surprised? I have here 16 to 18 because as long as you're 16 you can go into the tents until 6 o'clock at night or maybe 8 o'clock but then you have to leave. That's why I put 16. Um, it's not so surprising that younger people are still maybe more willing yeah, to paint a town red to the, let their inner p uh, pig loose. What really surprised me was this, that males only 17.4% totally agreed with this statement or 15.9% mostly, that is um, about 33%. 
whereas 66% of the women said, I totally agree with this statement, or I agree mostly. And then I was like, what is this? Because when I observed, I in general did not realize any gender specifics of how people celebrate. So why is it that women think, you know, I really let myself go, and guys are like, me. So it, it just, and for me, the only way to explain this is, if you behave like this as a woman, you might break more um, gender expectations, role expectations, than if a man is doing that. Or if you remember that little video clip, you had the one guy doing a Aah! So now imagine, you know, we all think, oh, okay, this is how men behave. Well, but women don't do that, right? Or women are not physical. Women are not supposed to sweat. Women are not supposed to be loud and take room. This is what guys do. And it could be that because you behave like men do, you break actually more little role expectations and thus you think, oh, really, I let myself go when just by the sheer observation, pff, it looks the same. Um, novelties, that is my last statement about those Trachten, those Dindels and the Lederhosen. Um, the challenge is here that in the science, so in, if you do uh, cultural studies, the term Tracht is rather used narrow, which means it's used in that context, which is formal rural clothing with clear-cut rules. Who could wear which colors, which cut, how many buttons, which color of headgear, what kind of, of, of pants. There was no variation. People had to wear that. And if people in, in, in the scientific community refer to that, so they call it Alpine style or Trachten style, because it is not this. This is basically anything goes. Also, the Dundel itself is kind of an invention of um, early, the turn of the century, so 19th to 20th century in Munich. It was like a, an, 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 a light summer dress. And um, this is the underwear of maids. Because honorable women were all the way up, all the way down, or even you had, you know, an additional vest on. Um, and as you can see, this is a picture from Stuttgart. This is right after the Second World War. There is no Dundel, there is no Lederhosen. And in Stuttgart, this whole phenomenon started about in the year 2000, 2001, 2002. And in Munich, it started about 1990. And if you look on all the pictures, well, as I said earlier, people went in jeans and t-shirt. One last slide, um, what I already mentioned, and then you can ask questions, um, about this fluid and solid, or the playful testing and reaffirmation. In this case, this is a company outing, and why do I know it? Because this was the company I was working for. And um, so we had the owners and the big boss, the CEO, is sitting there, and if you sit at benches and a long table. There is nobody that has the prime spot, you know, with the armrests. No, you sit equal. This is very equalizing. And also you drink together and you toast together. Well, at the same time, there is a status differentiation because in that case, he is the one who's paying. And you do not forget that. So it's that, it's that at the same, you know, you have at the same kind of an equalization, you know, you might end up uh, swinging and swaying with your boss, you know, you sit right next to him, or you sing with him, and you clink and dance, and, or my, you might have an, an um, 
an intern that can then do those line dance moves much better and teaches those moves to the higher ups. But you still know who is the boss. This is not forgotten. And in that case, in, it, when it comes to paying or what I noticed is not always people want to dance or engage. And if you stand on a bench and you pull someone up, um, it could be that the person says, eh, I don't want to. Well, if your boss gets up and then says, oh, people want to. So this is, uh, yeah. But let it be at that point so you can see how it is fluid and solid. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? We can start, we can still look what they are doing. Yes? Yeah. Um, so does this kind of behavior, is this similar to what happens in the soccer stadiums? That's a good question. Um, the difference is in the soccer stadiums, you do have two opposing teams. But what you, what, what you can see is this kind of what happens within one team, I would say yes. This is the same kind of behavior. Or similar. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in two years in Stuttgart, they will celebrate their 200th birthday, but I think it's like fest number 172, three or five. Um, so during the war time, it was stopped. Then it was stopped right after the First World War because there was just, there was, it was, there was not enough to go around. And then way back in the 19th century, they also decided to just do it every other year for a while. But yes. Yeah. It's really unified. What is not liked is it's actually younger people that we call it in German Kampf trinken, so um, fight drinking. And that is that binge drinking. And yes, younger people often drink liquor up at home already and, and, and basically come and drink to the bing. And this is not liked. Mm -mm. But that's a problem of the younger ones. Yes? No, go ahead. Um, well, there's lots of rides and things there. Are there families? Are there family yes. times, certain times of the week or early on Saturday or Sunday? Are there families? You can go there with your, oh, wait, it's here, with your child all the time. So another webcam, and obviously at this time, maybe there are not so many families, but the rides are continuously going on, and I have some, I have to say, some sweet memories when we went there as a family, and it was getting dark, and you have all the lights, and you know, oh, I might be staying up way past bedtime, <laughs> which you didn't, but it, it, yes, there are families. And even in, during the day, you can go in there with your children. Yes. Oh, I was just gonna say, do you think like the like the crowd mindset, like does that ever cause issues like with violence, like you know, like that high mindset? So there are instances of violent violence. So yes, there are um, sometimes hey, people are liquored up. That also means you have a higher chance of getting aggressive. It's just and you're you know, and you're 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 tight and you move. So you know, before you know it, people start shove and push. Um, I went there 26 times and the, I saw only once the beginning of a fight. And before I knew what was happening, security was there. They were incredibly fast. And then the other thing is now you sit, which of course is a limitation of if you do participant observation in that field all alone, if you are here 
and you stand, and this is what you see. Oh, you see maybe up to here. Yeah. You don't see the rest. You don't know what happens over there. And um, the musician says, sure, there is, well, you see people fighting. You see people trying to have sex there. Um, but there is security. This is not being tolerated. Um, there, the musician also told me there was one person one year who thought, what a great idea, I bring along pepper spray and use it. <laughs> and then the, they called the police and the police told the band, continue. Because you don't want a mass panic. And so the, the band just played, kept on playing. Yes, maybe not all those super party songs, so you go into more mellow songs. And while then the police was, uh, were searching for um, the culprit and found that person too. But this is, keep in mind, we have in, in Munich, you have about, it's more 114,000 or something, or 100, at least 100,000 seats in the tents every night. And in Stuttgart, it's 30,000. So if you have, you know, one or two instances where people do something like that, this is neglectable. If you just think about it. And if it wouldn't be safe, people would not go there. And I have to say, I, in, in all my time in, in Stuttgart, yes, I saw once uh, a woman exposing her breasts. In that one time, you know, that's the one you don't, you will never forget that. <laughs> But it's not that this happens often. And I have to say, if it is someone who is doing that, it's mostly American tourists. <laughs> because this is something Americans do, think Jerry Springer show. This has a very different <laughs> cultural setting. But hey, if you are in a dundel, there's no way you can, you can flash. No way, because you know they are up here, and it, it just, it's not going to happen. That's it. Thank you very much.